Hi students, welcome back to the online video lectures of the Medical Imaging course. This is a second video lecture on CT image reconstruction. In the last video, what we discussed is, let's say you have a 2D object and you are taking a parallel projection of that object on a one dimensional space. Then what we have explored in the last class is how is the one dimensional projection suppose given that your parallel projection is done at an angle theta with respect to the x axis what is the relationship between the 1d projection of the object 2d object that you have got with respect to the original 2d object that's what we have discussed in the previous video lecture what we will do in this lecture is let's take a relationship between the same two entities now in the frequency domain. In other words, again consider a 2D object. You have a two-dimensional continuous time Fourier transform of that object and then you have taken a one-dimensional projection through a parallel set of rays that are coming at an angle theta with respect to the x-axis and now you compute the one-dimensional continuous time Fourier transform of this projection and how is the Fourier transform of this projection is related to the two-dimensional Fourier transform of the given two-dimensional object. That's what we are going to discuss here. Although we are discussing it here in the context of CT, this theorem plays a vital role even in case of MR imaging, but used in a slightly different way. We will come back to that while we are discussing with MR. And uh, this theorem is known as Fourier slice theorem. This is also referred to as central cross-section theorem and sometimes this is also referred to as uh, projection slice theorem. Okay. With that background, let's go to a notebook mode and let's uh, see more details about this Fourier slice theorem. Let me restate the problem again that I am just now mentioning. Let's say we have an object in 2D. Let this be your object in 2D. Let's call it as f of x comma y. So this is your x axis and this is your y axis. Now, let's say I compute the two dimensional CTFT of it. So we will move on to kx ky space here. This is your kx ky. Let me call this as capital F of kx comma ky. Assume that now I am taking a parallel projection of this object at an angle theta here of this two dimensional object. Let me call this as g theta of x prime. This is your x prime axis and this is making an angle of theta here. If you want to plot the same thing here, so this is your x prime is in this direction here. Okay, and this angle is theta. Now, to this g theta of x prime, so what you have here is g theta of x prime. To this g theta of x prime, you compute the one dimensional CTFT of it and you'll have something here with varying values of kx and this let's call it as capital G theta of kx and the question is how is this related to f of kx comma ky? That's what we are going to explore in this video lecture. As we did in the previous video lecture for CT image reconstruction, here also, let's start with a simple case where I am taking a projection of this f of xy with theta equal to 0. So for this object, I am taking a simple projection here like this this being my x-axis and this being my y-axis 
assume that here I got let me simply call it as g of x this is x axis and let the two dimensional ct ft of it let me again call that as capital F of kx comma ky and let's now compute the capital G of kx and try to establish what's the relationship here so as you notice here we are considering a special case here with theta equal to 0 where your detector is at an angle theta equal to 0 so what we did what did we say for x f of x y the two dimensional ct ft of it is f of kx comma ky and for g of x the one dimensional ct ft of it is g of kx let's write first the expression for capital f of kx comma ky given its value in the two dimensional spatial domain so you have let's say x varying from minus infinity to plus infinity y varying from minus infinity to plus infinity f of x comma y into e power minus j 2 pi times kx into x plus ky into y dy dx now we need to find out the Fourier transform for g of x so first let us write g of x expression given f of x comma y how do you get that you take integrate for a given value of x you integrate it uh, over all values of y so for a given value of x here you could write y varying from minus infinity to plus infinity you integrate further f of x y with respect to dy now write the given g of x now write the continuous time 1d continuous time Fourier transform g of kx which would be equal to x varying from minus infinity to plus infinity g of x into e power minus j 2 pi times kx into x dx you already know the expression for g of x so substitute g of x value g here right that would give you the one dimensional Fourier transform of g of x is equal to x varying from minus infinity to plus infinity y varying from <coughs> minus infinity to plus infinity because that's what g of x is into f of x comma y let me just put it a little later this dy before that let me write e power minus j 2 pi kx into x and now let me write the dy followed by dx all right so now take a look at this expression f of kx comma ky and this how are they related well all that is missing is this term ky into y here right other than that so in order if i have to get g of kx from f of kx ky what should i do now y i cannot put a it's not a constant something varying from minus infinity to plus infinity so if i put here this ky value to be equal to zero then these two expressions are going to be same so in other words <coughs> let me write it this as x varying from minus infinity to plus infinity y varying from minus infinity to plus infinity f of x y into e power minus 2 pi of kx into x plus 0 into y times dy dx right so you compare these two expressions that implies your g of kx is equal to f of kx comma 
ky equal to 0. In your Fourier transform expression of f of x comma y, you just make ky equal to 0, that would give you the expression that would be same as g of kx. This is very interesting result. Why is it so? So what's happening here? Take a closer look here. So if you are taking projection in a way that you are filling this value here, this value for kx equal to whatever value is there. Okay, don't confuse that there is a value here. We are not plotting here. Okay, but this exactly would give you this values. So if your theta equal to zero, then this value here, this line across along this, you will get all the values there. They will nicely, these all values, okay. So I have not plotted here because I can't plot 3D, but something like this, this is exactly these values, whichever you get at kx equal to zero. Now, this is a special case we considered. Next question I am going to pose you is, suppose I am not going to do a projection at theta equal to 0 but parallel projection at some other angle which means say I am projecting it like this now and uh, let's say it is in at an angle theta right and assume that this is giving me now I call it as g theta of x prime this is your x prime I call it this is x this is y and of course now this is your x prime here. In other words, if you rotate it, then it is exactly same as the earlier one. So now you have like earlier 2D CTFT of this f of xy which we refer to as capital F of kx comma ky and similarly the one dimensional CTFT of G, G theta of X, which let's call it as G capital G subscript theta of K X and how are they related? This is not that difficult as it appears, provided you make use of the earlier knowledge that we gained while we are dealing with the continuous time Fourier transform. Suppose you are taking at an anti-clockwise direction of theta a parallel projection is that not equivalent to taking a projection at theta equal to 0 but where you have instead rotated your object in the clockwise direction by theta yes of course both would be the same one next question I am going to put is for f of x y assume that here I have a two dimensional CTFT of capital F of kx comma ky if I rotate it let's say by theta this f of xy that is let me call that new f1 of x, xy which is obtained by rotating f of xy by theta then let's call that new Fourier transform of that new function f1 of kx comma ky how is this related to this? This is something we worked out uh, or at least we discussed uh, in our earlier classes. You can figure out to other sources as well for the derivation of this. This is pretty straightforward. What would you get if you do this? This is also a rotated version of, the, of f of x, y also. The Fourier, if you rotate the object by an angle theta, the Fourier spectrum of that also gets rotated by an angle theta that's the result okay so if you make use of that result what can you say now for the sake of better illustration let me draw here f of x y rather and then let's plot where this g theta of x y would correspond there assume that i have some f of k x comma k y what is now going to happen here is if you have taken a projection at theta angle then here also if you take 
at an angle theta that is where this g theta of kx would correspond to very interesting result okay this again based on this inference this logic you could extend this here as if you are rotating this object and taking a projection parallel to the y axis then it would be this since that now you rotate by theta that would give you this projection which is at an angle theta so this in fact would correspond to this which kx here at certain angle this is a very very important theorem now even by taking fourier projections of a given object you could start filling the kx space kx ky space here of the original 2d object just from the 1d fourier transforms of the projections you could fill the space of the two dimensional fourier transform if you are taking a projection at theta it goes at theta suppose if you have taken a projection at 90 degrees this would come this would give you all the value at k x equal to 0 along this so on and so forth that's how you could fill you with the implications of it would become even more clear by the end of this lecture so before that let me just write what this is referred to as again this is called as fourier slice theorem or projection slice theorem or another word for this is central projection theorem it is referred by all these names so as i mentioned what it says let g theta of x prime be the projection of f of x y at some angle theta then f of k x k y be the two dimensional fourier transform of f of x y then what you could say is one dimensional fourier transform of this function is in fact two dimensional fourier transform of kx ky along the radian line which is there at the same angle this is the very important theorem here okay so let us again come back to our notebook let's uh, make few more observations here let's say your 2d object f of xy you are taking a projection like this which is giving you let's say z0 of x we figured out that this would correspond to all the values along this kx line of f of kx comma ky but however this being your sensor or detector of the x rays which requires a static but it could have you, you sensors would take a particular region here so in that way this values which you have is in fact a discretized version is what you would be having the moment you have z naught x here so that correspondingly that would eventually result in having the samples here at let's say some regular intervals here now let's assume that you are making another projection okay like this all the values here and constructing the g theta of x here or x prime here this we call it as x prime now what would happen this would give us now the values along the same theta so this is your theta here okay or this is your x prime here so that's theta now this is where it would give again this would give you values because of the sensor discretization you have values at regular intervals here now another thing you would do now is you keep varying theta so with that you get these value at different values here at different discretizations here of course one you could for instance have here as well so this is how you could acquire the values along this axis if i want to obtain from here f of x y what should i do then so right now if you look at it my samples that have been acquired in the space of f of k x comma k y are like this so this i could draw for example a line here and then here 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 i could draw more if you want in between and here across each points these 
not like this some acquisitions have been done like this here for the reasons of the discretizations that come as a result of your census occupying certain length limitations of that census size of the census you would be getting a samples of this like this now if you want to compute f of x comma y you need to acquire these samples at uniform grid so let's say here here so if i interpolate let's say the values that i am getting as a result of various projections there onto a uniform grid of points which i am showing here in that case to those uniform grid points the inverse dft of it then you would what it would give you is essentially provided you have enough samples what you get is f of x y so that's something you could do in case of ct you simply take projections at different angles you get something like this polar coordinates you take enough angles there let's say few more samples here then you interpolate them onto a uniform grid based on its neighborhood values of this kx ky space and to that uniform grid of points you compute the inverse dft of it and that would give you of course to be more precise it would give you f of m comma n there anyway the moment you are storing it as an image that's f of m comma n that's what you would be getting right if it is an mr image you will come back to it little later you would be acquiring your signal in kx ky space so you have a control over your kx ky space acquisition okay so on the other hand in our current ct imaging what you would do is you take projections of it so you could do if for example one thing that you could do is interpolate your kx ky space interpolate your kx ky space it's almost equivalent to converting from polar to rectangular coordinates do you see any problem here see here at low frequency regions okay around the center you have enough number of samples around the center but as you move away from the center you could notice you have less number of samples from which you need to interpolate so there is a problem interpolation becomes erroneous as you move on at high frequencies so the problem here is interpolation at high frequencies is a problem so i hope that's clear to you the main message there is if you are having a projection your sensor is at an angle of theta fourier transform of that projection one dimensional projection corresponds to the kx ky space acquisition at that particular at the same angle theta and that's how you could fill your kx ky space this works okay but as you move on away in the kx ky space as you are going to the high frequencies then there is an issue of uh, interpolation becomes erroneous and to deal with this again people won't be exactly doing in this manner by going into the fourier domain in case of ct images so there are other methods and hopefully we will discuss one more method in the next video lecture we'll stop here thanks for watching see you in the next video lecture bye take care